Hello everybody. It's Sunday. Sunday evening. Late afternoon, evening. Night, depending on your time zone. But, welcome to another stream from Purblind Gamer. That would be me, in case it's not obvious. Hey, I can't believe that I've done 50 official streams so far. On the one hand, it seems like a lot, and I have done a fair number of games, but then other times it seems like it's a surprising amount. <laughs> and also, a bunch of the streams I've done have been you know, short games, like one-shot ones. That probably makes it seem like more. I'm not sure. Hey, surfins! <laughs> yeah, I think it does get away from you. But how are you doing today, Surfins? Everybody, please go check out Surfins. He's a variety streamer who streams a bunch of awesome retro games. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. And it was last time I saw streaming Super Mario World and doing quite well. Ah, figuring out what to stream. Yeah, it takes a while to plan out, or at least I tend to put possibly too much thought into it. Ah, but you feel a good amount of energy? Oh no, I enjoyed your stream yesterday. <laughs> Playing a, was it Night Nightmare Reaper and then Super Mario World? It's quite a combination. That, yeah, it makes sense, like, if you, you don't always have the energy to stream, so, you know, stream when you do have the energy. That's, that's the way I figure it, anyhow. <clears throat> uh, today we're going to be playing 39 Steps, as I promised, which, and what I've been reading on it, it's more of a visual novel adventure game hybrid, and... I said it was not released in the U.S. That's not quite right. It was not released in the or in North America on CD-ROM, but it, it's available on Steam now. You can uh, get, buy it on Steam anywhere in the world, I assume. I just had a DVD-ROM copy that I never got around to playing. And I'm pretty excited to try this. Uh, if it, um, you guys may not have read The 39 Steps. It's... Like, one of the first modern thrillers ever. It was... I, I kind of thought it was the first, but I looked it up today, and they say that Riddle in the Sands, which is also the first work of spy fiction, is arguably the first modern thriller. Which is crazy, because my computer's resting on a large print copy of Riddle of the Sands. So, weird coincidence. The 39 Steps... You're probably more familiar with the Alfred Hitchcock film adaptation, which I remember as being one of my favorite Hitchcock movies, although I haven't seen it since I was, like, 12. But it's extremely different from the novel. There was a movie in the 70s that was based on the novel and followed it more closely, but that was never released in the United States. The, yeah, wow, Scotland, way to keep all the good stuff for yourself. I'll remember this. Next time I'm thinking of releasing something in Scotland. The 39 Steps is set. Uh, it was written during World War I, and it's set right before World War I. And I don't, I don't remember the plot in that much detail, since I probably read it. I don't know, not, not ten years ago, maybe eight years ago. And then gave my copy away to a friend who was skipping the country. So, I'm sure I'll be reminded of plenty of it as we go along. It, it's, it'll take about, it takes about six hours to play through, or five, five hours maybe. So we'll go through it and see how, you know, maybe I'll play half of it today. But hopefully everybody will enjoy it. It's kind of too bad the company didn't do more like this. 
that it got kind of mixed reviews, but a lot of positive ones, and a lot of the reviews found some things to like about it, even if, when they acknowledged its shortcomings. And it's kind of an interesting study in, you know, adapting classic novels into video game form. Which I know they've been struggling with over the years. This was from 2013, I believe, and they were... The developers were saying when they made it, there hadn't been a whole lot like this. I'll go ahead and switch over. And I'm trying this without text-to-speech today because it's fully voice acted by professional actors, so I don't want to get in the way of that. And it's coded in Unity. And, oh, I almost forgot to tell you guys, I think I've finally figured out the issue that was causing GPU spikes and crashing my stream. But I changed one obscure setting in my magnification software and yeah, instead of taking up 50% of my GPU's processing power, it now takes up less than 10%. So maybe that will mean it doesn't crash. But this is a computer. Who really knows? Nobody, that's who. Also, Scot Scottish development team that made this. <laughs> oh, a win recent Windows update surfing. Yeah, yeah, that caused some issues for me because I only got the update a couple days ago, or, or no, it was yesterday. But this was an issue I'd had for several months, and specifically was I figured out with my magnification software. So. Fingers crossed. No more crashes. <laughs> hey, Waffle Feet. Yeah, I like the music and the presentation style. The stark silhouette images. How are you doing, Waffle Feet? It's good to see you again. I know sometimes I'm streaming kind of late, but... <laughs> A bit more reasonable today. Of unfortunate events movie. <laughs> oh, wow. A lot of people are institutions. <laughs> oh, look at the Scottish stuff. <laughs> oh, you miss being able to be a night owl. <laughs> Yeah, I know, sometimes work makes demands. Do you have a job that it makes you keep regular hours, Waffle Feet? I always love Scottish culture and folklore. It does own surfins, yeah. I think because my father read me Robert Louis Stevenson novels when I was younger, and some other novels set in Scotland. Oh yeah, and I grew up watching DuckTales. That might have had something to do with it. Love Limmy. What is Limmy? It sounds like some Scottish term I'm not familiar with, but probably should be. Go ahead and... Oh wow, I played 
played that much time doing various tests. Oh, a Scottish comedian turned streamer. Interesting. I, mean, I should check him out. Original text. No dialect. Haha. <laughs> we want dialect. Oh my gosh, you can play the game in Scots Gaelic. How cool is that? Fun. Oh, is he had a sketch show in 2010 called Limmy's Sketch Show. Or Limmy's Show. Unfortunately or fortunately. Yeah, well, feed, I know. I can see it both ways. Surreal humor about relatable parts of life. That does sound like something I would enjoy. Surreal humor. Yeah. Since I don't speak Scots Gaelic fluently, or indeed at all, I guess we'll just go with the original text. But I do like that they do that. It makes sense that they did it. I wonder if the original novel was ever translated into Scots Gaelic. Reset the game. 80 words. <laughs> Thanks, Duolingo. Well, if you know 80 words of it, you're knowing more, you know more than me. <laughs> Duolingo does make it easy to learn or dabble in languages you wouldn't otherwise. I'm gonna be lurking, but gotta restart and prepare. Hey, that's that's great, Surfins. I really appreciate you coming by, and hope your stream goes well. I'll try and check some of it out later. Oh, I'm so glad the vibes help put you at ease. That, that means a lot to me. I, I try to have a cool, you know, chill stream, even when I'm playing horror games. <laughs> and just you know, welcoming for anybody who's able to stop by. Thanks, Surfins. I, I appreciate the encouragement. I, I will keep it up. Yeah, I made it through 50 streams. Maybe I'll make it through another 50. Hill House stood for 50 years. It could well stand another 50. And those who lived there walked alone. Something like that. Oh, carve a unique space? I, I hope so. At least, if nothing else, I try to play interesting games that not everybody plays. And a few more mainstream ones, too. You know, I'm not above, you know, breaking out to Ocarina of Time or something. <laughs> I hear it's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, reset. Set the wrong user. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> yeah, thank you, definitely, Waffle. Indeed, I really appreciate it. Both of you guys, and anybody who comes through or lurks. to advance the text. Anti-clockwise makes you go back. Interesting. When you reach the end of a string of text, you will see a diamond. Simply click anywhere to advance the scene, moving the story forward. Anti-clockwise. I wonder if that's a Scots thing or just a British thing in general. Official lurker. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. 
a pointer-free experience, but when you see one, that's your cue to interact. Ah, EG. Should zoom out a touch. Some locations can be explored. When you're in explore mode, you can click and drag the mouse to look around. You can also interact with glowing objects. Interesting, that text is a slightly darker color than the Twitch chat overlay I have. <laughs> Makes it easier. <laughs> They do that thing like a, what's it called? Like Layers of Fear does, where you can switch to just text to make it easier to read. <laughs> Dear Mr. Hane, welcome to London. I hope your journey from Rhodesia was not too arduous. Would you like to come into the bank and we can discuss matters regarding your mining shares? If you could please make an appointment with my clerk, Mr. Scroop, on Temple 6733. Yours sincerely. Edward Ainsley, manager. Let's do a bartender named Ainsley. Oh, I see. It's got a or a circle in it based on whether you can interact. That's useful. Congratulations, you made it through our short tutorial and have been given an award for your efforts. There are 15 more of these to collect. <laughs> Which is interesting, it close. I wonder if they planned it for a Steam release, because it seems like Steam Achievement, but it's on a DVD-ROM. You will shortly begin your journey through the 39 steps. All progress will be auto-saved, but you can also use bookmarks to manage your progress. Select the first one to begin. <laughs> Quick tutorial indeed. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty... Straightforward gameplay. Easy even by visual novel standards, in which I've only really dabbled. Like, the developers really wanted to make it accessible to everybody, even non-gamers. <laughs> the Wrong Ditch. May 18th, 1914, London, England. I returned from the city on that May afternoon pretty well disgusted with life. I had been three months in the old country and was fed up with it. Oh wait, Hannah's Scottish, isn't he? Mm. I... Richard Hannay, you have got into the wrong ditch, my friend, and you had better climb out. My father brought me out from Scotland to South Africa at the age of six, and I had never been home since. 
So why the fuck is the asinine streamer raiding me with a Scots accent? It's like he didn't read the book for eight years. <laughs> I grew up in the Cape Colony, which was then under British rule. I don't really know the difference between the South African accent and the British accent. I know my seventh grade English teacher was South African. <clears throat> I spent much of my time by the Zambesi, where I would fish. There are several hundred species in its waters, including the infamous tigerfish and Zambezi shark. The wide open spaces of the veldt also interested me greatly, and the various methods of survival in such an uncompromising landscape. <laughs> yeah, waffle feet. You know my sense of humor. <laughs> I had earned my pile, not one of the big ones, but good enough for me. I put in three years prospecting for copper in German Damaraland and spoke the German tongue pretty fluently. I went on to become a mining engineer in Kimberley, where I was instrumental in the formation of the De Beers Consolidated Mine. The diamond mines were a rough business, with countless good men lost in horrific accidents. I served the British forces during the Matabella conflict and was decorated for my role. I served two years in the Imperial Light Horse and was an intelligence officer at Delagoa Bay in the Second Boer War. I lost many friends during those wars. I didn't know they used the term intelligence officer that early on. Or if I did, I'd forgotten. My final years in Africa were in the municipality of Bulawayo, where I fought during the Matabela War. I resided once again with my father, who had taken ill. After he died, I decided to leave the Cape and head back to the old country. The present. The past unearthed. A lot of imperialist ladies asked me to tea to meet schoolmasters from New Zealand and editors from Vancouver, and that was the most dismal business of all. I had no real pal to go about with, which probably explains things. Plenty of people invited me to their houses, but they didn't seem much interested in me. I had counted on stopping in London for the rest of my days, but from the first I was disappointed with it. I was the best bored man in London. Okay, now we're going to see a bit more of Hene's personality, which, which I remember as being a lot of fun in the book. <laughs> really should reread that. And there were several sequels to the book, too, which I've yet to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here I was, 37 years old, sound in mind and limb, with enough money to have a good time, yawning my head off all day. I had a long drink and read the evening papers. They were full of the row in the Near East, and there was an article about Karolides, the Greek premier. From all accounts, he seemed one of the big men in the show, and he played a straight game too, which is more than could be said for most of them. Someone had loaded the cylinder player. I felt a deep nostalgia for my homeland of Scotland as Annie Laurie filled the room. Ah, okay. I know I have heard that song before. Too many horror adventures because I keep expecting something ominous. <laughs> I hope this wax cylinder from 1914 is in public domain. 
If not, I'll eat my hat. There doesn't seem to be a way to interact with this. Oops. The sound and music is good, soothing. Yeah! I agree, it is. I think that's what they were going for, especially early on, before the action picks up. Oh, continue. Did I just... Well, fudge bars. Note to self. Do not touch the right mouse button. Ever. Hmm. Oh, well, at least we weren't too far. And hopefully the bookmarks are rather frequent. Richard Hannay, you have got into the wrong ditch, my friend, and you had better climb out. Yeah, I try not to curse too much on stream. <laughs> I mean, I slip up sometimes. It is the 21st century. <laughs> Gotta steal that. <laughs> no, for a while I, I, I used to start saying flipper fudge borrow fizz, because... There's the line from some play. And then that was too long, so I think I just shortened it to fudge bars. But hey, that's how idioms are born. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it must have been a difficult task at the adapting. You know, a hundred year old novel, which and trying to make a game that would appeal to, you know, older people and well-read people and the younger generation and people who never knew, or who didn't know the story except from the Hitchcock movie. <laughs> a challenge. It kind of feels so far like they were targeting the game more to readers, and perhaps that accounts for somewhat of the soothing tone. Twelve pages, one penny. <laughs> Peasants' Revolt in Albania. I'm not going to read all of these, that would take ages. Ooh, a runabout. He sees, he reasons, he buys. Their concept of the human brain in 1914. A step up from phrenology. Ah, Karolainis creep strong. Keen ally of Britain. Feared in London. Oh no, fettered in Latin, London. And hated in Berlin and Vienna. <laughs> the ginger nuts are on sale, yeah. Which, ginger nuts. I don't know if I've ever had ginger nuts. Have I? Seems there are ginger nut flavored biscuits in England. Empire celebrations. Rain won't stop the show. Queen Victoria's 95th birthday. Wingarnies. <laughs> Weak, anemic, nervy, run down. We 
British Navy must grow. Aloha warns of the German menace. Yeah. In 1914, like, yeah, early to mid-1914, they had suspicions war was on the horizon. I think we've seen all of that. Newspapers, eh? Criterion. Hey, those are those guys who put out all the Blu-rays of movies. And, you know, subtitle rather than dub. I don't like them. Uh, I'm assuming this is all just, you know, give us a bit of flavor of the time period. Flying races, the British and German programs. Fashions for men, choice of cloth for a lounge, shoes, lounge suit. News of the Navy, the joy of good clothes. Oh, nice, you can zoom part way out. Newspapers sure looked different back then. Hmm. So did fashions. <laughs> British Empire. Huge the empire was. So Canada was wasn't independent yet. Huh. Shows you how not much I know about Canadian history. Wow. Yes, I, th I think the map has changed a bit in, like, the hundred years between when the book was mi written and the game was made. <laughs> Certainly would hope so. <laughs> um, empire at home and abroad. Fishing. Big game hunt shooting. <laughs> I wonder if they actually, you know, grabbed scans of real period books. There's two diamonds below the. What's it called? The scene title or location description. Maybe that's supposed to tell us how many things we can examine in the scene. Mm -hmm. The graphics are good. About six o'clock I went home. Yeah, you would think the copyright would be gone for all the books by then. Waffle feet. I know it's different in some countries and like in England, but at least in the U.S., it's like a good rule of thumb is. No, shoot, it started moving forward again. I think at this point, 1924 and earlier, everything's in public domain. After that, it gets complicated. <clears> hmm. <throat> But yeah, you can just do anything you like with most things written before then. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
I had read that all the backgrounds are hand painted. And I don't, I don't know if they mean that literally or just the style. My flat was the first floor in a new block behind Langham Place. There was no restaurant or anything of that sort, and each flat was quite shut off from the others. <clears throat> if only Mist had done this. <laughs> and scratches, and ex mortis, and most things. Yeah, I know, it's surprising. Awful heat. They put a lot of effort into this. I think that, I think I read the core team was about ten people. Mm. Dear Richard, how is London? I do hope Paddock is looking after you well, and that your luck on the horses is lasting out. Ten to one it is. Now here's a tale for you. Last month in the Kalahar Kalahadi, I found myself in a tight spot. After two days on the plain, I lost my way and could not find the river. I was forced to go without water for three days and five without a morsel of food, save for a few mopane worms, an excellent source of protein, which steered me away from starvation. Then I ran into an old chief to whom I owed money. Because of my debt, he refused to help me, so I had to continue my f on my feet. The desert is not kind to any man, but I made it out, and a man in Tanganyika sold me a Rhodesian ridgeback, which will be my partner in my future hunts. A ridgeback is some kind of animal. I've named the animal Shaka, after the old Zulu chief, and will take him to the Congo with me when I go for elephants. I plan to leave next week if I can get my new rifle finished in time. Yours, Peter P Pinar. I wonder if that's a Dutch name, the two A's. Oh, that's just the second half of the letter. <clears throat> ah. Wanted to fit in a bit more game elements. <laughs> Oh, it's a big dog. Ah, thanks, Waffle Feet. Paddock, that's me home. I'll be heading out for dinner. I feel like I've heard the term Ridgeback before, but I wasn't sure what it was. I hate, I hate, I hate servants on the premises, so I had a fellow to look after me who came in by day. By the day. He arrived before eight o'clock, every morning, and used to depart at seven, for I never dined at home. Mm. Where are we headed to now? That evening, I dined at the Café Royale, and then headed elsewhere for entertainment. Hmm. Alhambra. I think there's an area of Los Angeles called Alhambra. Near where my grandmother used to live. Or something similar. Leicester Square. On this particular evening, I wandered to Leicester Square, where the more resplendent theatre 
of varieties could be found. A show at the Alhambra caught my eye. One, though one can never be quite sure of the act until it has be, it had been seen. Goodbye, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way. Oops, wrong musical. The countless music halls of London were one way of passing the evening away. Farces of all styles played a conspicuous part in this week's bill. It was a silly show. I did not dare to stay long. It is a silly show. On the way home, I gave half a crown to a beggar because I saw him yawn. He was a fellow sufferer. Also bored in London. I made a vow. I would give the old country another day to fit me into something. If nothing happened, I would take the next boat for the Cape. Or events like chapters, kind of, yeah. Resolve to leave England for the king. Oh, well. Mm. Monday, May 18th, 1914. Wimpole Street, London. Maybe they just pronounce it Wimple. Hmm. Sure, I wouldn't know how they pronounce some things in England. Hey, can I speak to you? May I come in for a minute? I recognized him as the occupant of a flat on the top floor with whom I had passed the time of day on the stairs. He was, a sli he was slim with a short brown beard and small gimlety blue eyes. Gimlety. His hand was pawing at my arm. I motioned him in. I don't require perfect precision with that. No sooner was he over the threshold than he made a dash for my back room, where I used to smoke and write my letters. Then he bolted back. Is the door locked? He filled himself a stiff whiskey and soda and drank it off in three gulps. I sat down in an armchair and lit my pipe. I was pretty certain that I had to deal with a madman. I'm very sorry. It's a mighty liberty, but you look like the kind of man who would understand. I've had you in my mind all this week when things got troublesome. Is he American? Say, will you do me a good turn? I'll listen to you. That's all I'll promise. Pardon. I'm a bit rattled tonight. You see, I happen at this moment to be dead. What does it feel like? A smile flickered over his drawn face. I'm not mad. Yet. Say, sir, I've been watching you, and I reckon you're a cool customer. I reckon, too, you're an honest man and not afraid of playing a bold hand. I'm going to confide in you. I need help worse than any man ever needed it. I want to know if I can count you in. 
<laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get on with your yarn and I'll tell you. The queerest rigmarole. <laughs> I love that word. See almost on my screenplay, a peck of rigmarole. Franklin P. Scudder was an American. After college, being pretty well off, he started out to see the world. Oh my, making quite a track. He wrote a bit and acted as a war correspondent for a Chicago paper. Bachland's affairs test Europe. He had played about in politics, at first for interest, and then because he couldn't help himself. Then he made his discovery. In France? I couldn't tell. Away behind all the governments and the armies, there is a big subterranean movement going on, engineered by some very dangerous people. The sort of educated anarchists that make revolutions. And behind them were financiers who were playing for money. They wanted Russia and Germany at loggerheads. Everything would be on in the melting pot. The anarchists looked to see a new world emerge, while the capitalists would make fortunes by buying up wreckage. And Scudder had himself convinced that Jewish men were behind it all. On the 15th day of June, Constantine Karolides is coming to this city. The British Foreign Office has taken to having international tea parties, and the biggest of them is due on that date. Now, Karolides has reckoned the principal guest, and if my friends have their way, he will never return to his admiring countrymen. Huh. I sat up for that, for I had been reading about Carolides that after very afternoon. Well, that's simple enough, anyhow. You can warn him and keep him at home. <laughs> and play their game. If he does not come, they win, for he's the only man that can straighten out the tangle. And if his government are warned, he won't come, for he does not know how big the stakes will be on June the 15th. I was beginning to get very interested in the bugger. What about the British government? They're not going to let their guests be murdered. Tip them the wink, and they'll take extra precautions. No good. They might stuff your city with plainclothes detectives and double the police, and Constantine would still be a doomed man. He'll be murdered by an Austrian, and there'll be plenty of evidence to show the connivance of the big folk in Vienna and Berlin. It will all be an infernal lie, of course, but the case will look black enough to the world. But it's not going to come off if there's a certain man alive right here in London on the 15th day of June. And that man is going to be your servant, Franklin P. Scudder. Huh? I was getting to like the little chap. He had, his jaw had shut like a rat trap, and there was the fire of battle in his gimlety eyes. Where did you find out this story? I completed my evidence ten days ago in Paris. I can't tell you the details now, for it's something of a history. But when I was quite sure in my own mind, I judged it my business to disappear. 
and I reached his city by a mighty queer circuit. Till yesterday I thought I had muddied my trail some, and was feeling pretty happy. Then... The recollection seemed to upset him, and he gulped down some more whiskey. Then I saw a man standing in the street outside this block. I used to stay close in my room all day, and only slip out after dark for an hour or two. I watched him for a bit from my window, and I thought I recognized him. He came in and spoke to the porter. When I came back from my walk last night, I found a card in my letterbox. It bore the name of the man I want least to meet on God's earth. I think that the look in my companion's eyes, the sheer naked scare on his face, completed my conviction of his honesty. What did you do next? I realized I was bottled as sure as a pickled herring, <laughs> and that there was only one way out. I had to die. If my pursuers knew I was dead, they would go to sleep again. How did you manage it? How Scudder died. That's interesting, they all presented as a clock or adventure face. <laughs> or order. Mm -hmm. I told the man who valets me that I was feeling pretty bad and got myself up to look like death. That wasn't difficult, for I'm no slouch at disguises. Ominous music time, right? <laughs> Then I got a corpse. You can always get a body in London if you know where to go for it. I fetched it back in a trunk on the top of a four-wheeler, and I had to be assisted upstairs to my room. I had to pile up evidence for the inquest, so I went to bed and got my man to mix me a sleeping draft, and then I told him to clear out. He wanted to fetch a doctor, but I swore some and said I couldn't abide leeches. When I was left alone, I started to fake up that corpse. He was my size, and I judged he hadn't perished from too he had perished from too much alcohol, so I put some spirits about the place. The jaw was the weak point in the likeness, so I blew it away with the revolver. I dare say there will be somebody to swear having heard a shot. But there are no neighbors on my floor, and I guess I could risk it. I left the body in bed, dressed up in my pajamas with a revolver lying on the bedclothes and a considerable mess around. Then I got into a suit of clothes I had kept waiting for emergencies. I didn't dare shave for fear of leaving tracks, and besides, it wasn't any kind of use my trying to get into the streets. I had had you in my mind all day, and there seemed nothing to do but to make an appeal to you. I watched from my window till I saw you come home, and then slipped down the stair to meet you. He had the blink. He was. He sat blinking like an owl, fluttering with nerves and despair, with nerves and desperately determined. There, sir. I guess you know about as much as me of this business. a drink. I was now pretty well convinced that he was going straight with me. It was the wildest sort of narrative, but I had learned but I had heard in my my time many steep tales which had turned out to be true. And if he had wanted to get a location in my flat and then cut my throat, he would have picked a mild he would have pitched a milder yarn. Hand me your key, and I'll take a look at the corpse. 
Excuse my caution, but I'm bound to verify a bit if I can. I reckon you'd ask for that. Completely sensible. But I haven't got it. It's on my chain on the dressing table. I had to leave it behind, for I couldn't leave any clues to breed suspicions. The gentry who are after me are pretty bright-eyed citizens. You'll have to take me on trust for the night, and tomorrow you'll get the proof of the corpse business right enough. Hmm. I thought for an instant or two. Right. I'll trust you for the night. I'll lock you into this room and keep the key. Just one word, Mr. Scudder. I believe you're straight. But if so be you are not, I should warn you that I'm a handy man with a gun. I haven't the privilege of your name, sir. But let me tell you that you're a true gentleman. Now, I'll thank you to lend me a razor. I took him into my bedroom and turned him loose. In half an hour's time, the figure came out that I scarcely recognized. My hat, Mr. Scudder. A new man. Only his gimlety, hungry eyes were the same. He was the very model, even to the brown complexion, of some British officer who had had a long spell in India. He was shaved clean, his hair was parted in the middle, and he had cut his eyebrows. Not Mr. Scudder. Captain Theopolis Digby of the 40th Gurkhas. Presently home on leave. I'll thank you to remember that, sir. Impressive change. I made him up a bed in the smoking room and sought my own couch, more cheerful than I had been for the past month. Things did happen occasionally, even in this god-forgotten metropolis. Deeper into the mess. Oh, a bit of a you know, not a very straight path through the game, I like that. Oh, deeper into this mess, excuse me. And there are multiple messes, it would seem. Tuesday, May 19th. that just faded from the foreground. <clears throat> Stop that row, Paddock. There's a friend of mine, Captain... Captain... Oh, he's dossing down in there. Get breakfast for two, and then come and speak to me. Dossing down. Well, I've heard that term before. Paddock. He had about as much gift of the gab as a hippopotamus and was not a great hand at valeting, but I knew I could count on his loyalty. Paddock was a fellow I had done a good turn to out on the Selaqui, and I had inspanned him. Inspanned? I had, I had inspanned him as my servant as soon as I got to England. And all sorts of new words and terms. I just hope I can retain them. I believe paddock means toad. Or is a name given to a toad. 
times. I told Paddock a fine story about how my friend was was a great swell with his nerves pretty bad from overwork who wanted absolute rest and stillness. Nobody had got to know he was here or he would be besieged by communications from the India office and the Prime Minister and his cure would be ruined. And I am bound to say Scudder played up splendidly when he came to breakfast. He fixed Paddock with his eyeglass, just like a British officer, and asked him about the Boer War, and slung out at and slung out at one a lot. Oh, and slung out at me a lot of stuff about imaginary pals. Paddock couldn't learn to call me Sir, but he surged Scudder as if his life depended on it. I left him with the newspaper and a box of eight of cigars and headed out to Alexandra Park Racecourse. Ah, yes, we did mention those horses earlier. Oh, when I got back, the lift man had an important fat face. Nasty business here this morning, sir. Gent in number 15 being in shot itself. I just took him to the oh, mortuary. Thank the you so much for the follow, Penny Black. I appreciate it. Yes, welcome to my channel. I hope you're having a good day. And Tanuki, Tanuki Witch. Oh, well, thank you, Nuki Witch. I really appreciate you guys following me. Oh. I ascended to number 15 and formed and found a couple of bobbies and an inspector busy making an examination. I asked a few idiotic questions and they soon kicked me out. And I'm glad you guys came to join me in playing the 39 steps and hope your weekend's going well. <laughs> I attended the inquest the next day. The jury found it a case of suicide while of unsound mind. I gave Scudder a full account of the affair and it interested him greatly. He said he wished he could have attended, for he reckoned it would be about as spicy to read as one's own obituary notice. Scudder's, Scudder was very peaceful the first two days he stayed with me. He read and smoked a bit and made a heap of jottings in a notebook and every night we had a game of chess, at which he beat me hollow. But on the third day I could see he was beginning to get restless. Oh, Scudder. <laughs> yes, waffle feet. <laughs> and definitely the humour is coming out more, which fits with the style they did that silent movie exposition earlier. He, mixed up, he fixed up a list of days and started m making remarks against them. He started listening to little noises and was always asking me if, the pa if Paddock could be trusted. Once or twice he got very peevish and apologized for it. I didn't blame him. I made every allowance for he had taken on a fairly stiff job. And then one night he was very solemn. Say, Hanny. What is it? I uh, judge I should let you a bit deeper into this business. I should hate to go out without leaving somebody else to put up a fight. 
you go on? He began to tell me in detail what had, what I had only heard from him vaguely. I did not give him very close attention. The fact is, I was more interested in his own adventures than in his high politics. The plot thickens. Blackstone. He talked about a black stone and a man that lisped in his speech, and he described very particularly somebody that he never referred to without a shudder, an old man who could hood his eyes like a hawk. Yes, I remember that from the novel. In the movie, they change it to somebody missing one joint on his little finger. But I never get a clear picture of what he means by hooding his eyes like a hawk. Carolides. I reckoned that Carolides and his affairs were not my business, so a lot that Scudder said slipped clean of my memory. He was very clear that the danger to Carolides would not begin till he had got to London, and would come from the very highest quarters, where there would be no thought of suspicion. He mentioned the name of a woman, Julia Zechenyi as having something to do with the danger. She would be the decoy, I gathered, to get Carolides out of the care of his gods. Guards. <laughs> he remained solemn for the rest of the evening and spoke a good deal about death. I reckon it's like going to sleep when you're pretty well tired out. Awaking to find a summer day with the scent of hay coming in at the window. I used to thank God for such mornings way back in the bluegrass country. And I guess I'll thank him when I wake up on the other side of Jordan. Mm. Yeah, a little cliche it is speeches about death go. <laughs> the next day, he was much more cheerful, and read the life of Stonewall Jackson much of the time, while the rest of London celebrated Empire Day. I went out to dinner with a mining engineer, whom I had to see on business, and came back in time for our game of chess before turning in. checking the mailbox today. Ah. I left Captain Digby reading in the smoking room with a fresh box of cigars. He was not interested in the Empire Day celebrations, but allowed me leave to go to see them. I have acquired fresh eggs and bacon for tomorrow's breakfast. Paddock. Stonewall Jackson, a cheerful read. <laughs> yes, waffle feet. I imagine it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Especially if it goes into detail about his military campaign. Is there nothing else we can examine here? Okay, when you hover over a hot spot, there's a light dot that appears in the middle of the, com the cursor that's useful. Unfortunate end. 
Now I can see what some of the critics were saying about how the pacing is a bit slow and you can't skip. Especially the transitions, but I don't know, I, I kind of like it. It's, it's slower pacing. Really an acquired taste even among people who play visual novels, but it does feel more like you're reading a book. In the soup. May 23rd, 1914, Whitpole Street. was more than I could bear. I like it. I think if I'm playing it, you might just play it over a few days and deal with the pacing issue. Yeah, I agree, Waffle Feet. And I think it's a good plan not to try and push through the whole thing in one sitting, but play half of it today. Staggered to a cupboard round the. I think found the brandy. I'd seen men die violently before. Indeed, I had killed a few myself in the Martabella War. But this cold blooded indoor business was different. I needed to think. Enemies had found him and had taken the best way to make certain of his silence. Scudder had been in my rooms for four days, and his enemies must have reckoned that he had confided in me. I would be next to go. It might be that very night, or the next day, or the day after. But my number was up all right. Supposing I went out now and called in the police, or went to bed and let Paddock find the body and call them in the morning. What kind of a story was I to tell about Scudder? The odds were a thousand to one that I would be charged with murder, and the circumstantial evidence was strong enough to hang me. Uh, yeah. Forensic science wasn't that advanced in 1914. See also how Scudder had faked his own death in the first place. Few people knew me in England. I had no real pal who could come forward and swear to my character. Perhaps that was what those secret enemies were playing for. They were clever enough for anything, and an English prison was as good a way of getting rid of me till after June 15th as a knife in my chest. If I told the whole story, and if by any miracle was believed, I would be playing their game. Carolides would stay at home, which was what they wanted. I am an ordinary sort of fellow, not braver than other people. But I hate to see a good man downed, and that long knife would not be the end of Scudder if I could play the game in his place. They hadn't reckoned on Hannay's fortitude. Someone must have been searching for something, perhaps for the pocketbook. skin cigar case Carolides comes to London Greek premier pushes for Balkan resolve international 
conference. Sir Walter Bullivant, permanent secretary of the Foreign Office, told the newspaper that the visit was part of a strategy to secure peace. Securing stability in the Balkans, uh, various new states, is crucial to our relations with the great powers. Second life. It used to be an online, uh, sort of virtual chat space called Second Life, I believe. I wonder if that's still around. American agent suicide by gunshot. Christopher Rick of Wimple Street, Paddington, formed the sub subject of an inquest held in the coroner's court before Mr. T.F. Parsons, since deceased was an American businessman discovered in his affluent fifth floor apartment on the 19th of May. Mr. Rick was known by few. His neighbors describing him as quiet, kept to himself. It was known as the businessman's affairs, except his brief encounter with Turnabout Publishing. Pope Wood propositions. Mr. Rick was meeting his targets and was in financial difficulties. Was not meeting his targets. On the evening of his death, he'd been behaving out of character. The valet described him as looking like death, with worries. Obviously, with worries obviously playing on his mind. Before retiring for the night, Rick had his valet mix a sleeping draft before dismissing him. That's sounding rather familiar. It is understood that Rick was an was adamant that he did not wish to see a doctor, so the valet did not send for professional medical attention. A large trunk was found empty in the fifth floor apartment. Where the lift man in Walt Wimpole Street resident said that it had had a considerable weight when he had helped the deceased take it to his room. Owing to the various bottles, empty bottles of hard liquor about the apartment, potentially the contents of the trunk. It is clear that Rick drank excessively before taking the revolver and shooting himself in the head, severely disfiguring the lower half of his face. The revolver was found on the bedclothes next to the body. No reports of a gunshot were noted on the evening of the death. Rick's was the only apartment on the fifth floor, and on the lower below, occupants Mr. and Mrs. Joe Twisden were out for the evening. The jury returned a verdict of suicide, while of unsound mind. With no identifiable next of kin, the deceased's possessions have been handed over to the American consul. I'm guessing how this is a deduce that Scudder wasn't dead. Stonewall Jackson. Do your duty and leave the rest to Providence. Let us too trust that all is well and look beyond the storm, beyond the darkness, blood, and mourning of the present. The sunshine seemed less bright, the future dark with clouds and gloom death. Jackson is dead, dead and gone like a common everyday mortal. Who could supply his place? Or is that all?
I guess that's the only important text. We found everything here, I think. I should have checked to see if those diamonds in the lower left corner changed color. But there are four, and we've examined four things. Haven't we? Yeah, look, the first one's a lighter color, so that's nice that they let you know whether you've done everything you can in a location or not. Oh, that's the body again. Was it Samuel Johnson who wrote, When you are tired of London, you are tired of life. Well, my dear Peter, if so, then I am tired of life, for here I am in London, bored and at my wit's end. The city is noisy and chaotic, and I can't get any exercise. I have yet to meet a suitable lady to pass my time with. I have met a fair few unsuitable ones. My bets are paying off on the track, however and my shares in the Rhodesian diamond mines continue to keep me dining in the capital's best restaurants, despite Paddock's continual insistence that I should dine at home and try his culinary skills. I can, one can only hope that they are better than his valet skills. Speak soon, my dear friend. Richard Hannay. received the letter from earlier on. I was still in Africa. There was no trace of Scudder's black book. Most likely the enemy found it, but they had not found it on Scudder's body. I had come to a decision. I must vanish somehow and keep vanished till the end of the second week in June. Something. Then I must find a way to get in touch with the government people and tell them what Scudder had told me. I wish to heaven he had told me more and that I had listened more carefully to what he had told me. There was a big risk that, even if I weathered the other dangers, I would not be believed in the end. I must take my chance of that, and hope that something might happen which would confirm my tale in the eyes of the government. I do like the cursor, that the cursor disappears when you can't interact with anything, so it doesn't leave you guessing. My notion was to get off to some wild district, where my veldcraft would be of some use to me, for I would be a tra be like a trapped rat in a city. Veldcraft. 
I considered that Scotland would be best, for my people were Scotch, and I could pass anywhere as an ordinary Scotsman. It's interesting that they still said Scotch back in, like, the turn of the 20th century. I knew it was, like, an older, in, like, that use, but I didn't realize it was, you know, still used that recently. I fixed on it. Oh. oh shoot. I accidentally skipped the text. Sunday. You're looking up the trains. How was I to make my way to St. St. Pancras train station? I was pretty certain that Scudder's friends would be watching for me outside. This puzzled me for a bit. Then I had an inspiration, on which I went to bed and slept for two troubled hours. Waking up, I had a great revulsion of feeling, and felt a god-forgotten fool. My inclination was to let things slide, and trust to the British police taking a reasonable view of my case. But as I reviewed the situation, I could find no arguments to bring against my decision of the previous night, so with a wry mouth, I resolved to go through, go on with my plan. I hunted out a well-used tweed suit, a pair of strong nailed boots, and a flannel shirt with a collar. Into my pockets I stuffed a spare shirt, a cloth cap, some handkerchiefs, and a toothbrush. I took fifty pounds of it, of it in sovereigns in a belt, which I had brought back from Rhodesia. Fifty pounds of... really do have so much detail in all these graphics that are only seen once. <laughs> these, these different shots. Oh. A shaving mini game. <laughs> or action sequence. I don't know exactly what you'd call this. <laughs> now came the next step. Paddock used to arrive punctually at 7.30 and let himself in with a latchkey. But about 20 minutes to 7, as I knew from bitter experience, the milkman turned up with a great clatter of cans and deposited... my share outside my door. On him I stacked all my chances. I went into the darkened smoking room, where I breakfasted off a whiskey and soda and some biscuits. By the time I was getting, it was by this time it was getting on for six o'clock. I put a pipe in my pocket and filled my pouch from the tobacco jar on the table by the fireplace. I haven't had digestive biscuits in so long, too long. It's a Scudder's book. It seemed a good omen. He knew I would find it in the tobacco.
goodbye, old chap. I'm going to do my best for you. Wish me well, wherever you are. I hung about in the hall waiting for the milkman. I was fairly choking to get out of doors. The fool, the fool had chosen this day of all to be late. Third class citizen. Sunday, May 24th, 1914. That's what we saw here earlier. Nice how they set that up. God blind me! Come in here a moment. I want a word with you. Y y yes, sir. <laughs> he was a younger man, a young man about my own height with an ill-nourished moustache and wearing a flat blue cap and white overalls. I reckon you're a bit of a sportsman and I want you to do me a service. Lend me your cap and overall for ten minutes and here's a sovereign for you. His eyes opened at the sight of the gold and he grinned broadly. What's the game? A bet. I haven't time to explain, but to win it... I've got to be a milkman for the next ten minutes, and all you've got to do is to stay here till I come back. You'll be a bit late, but nobody will complain, and you'll have that quid for yourself. Right, I ain't the man to spoil a bit of sport. Here's the rig, governor. Wearing his hat and overalls, I went whistling downstairs. First, I thought there was nobody in the street. Then I caught sight of a policeman a hundred yards down, and a loafer shuffling past on the other side. I crossed the street in character, whistling gaily and imitating the jaunty swing of the milkman. I know I've heard that tune. I think it was on a John Langstaff tape. I couldn't tell you what it is, though. Some impulse made me raise my made me raise my eyes to the house opposite, and there, at the first floor window, was a face. As the loafer passed, he looked up, and I fancied a signal was exchanged. Then I took the first side street. There was no one in the alleyway, so I dropped the milk cans inside a hoarding and set the cap and overall after them. I had only just put on my cloth cap when a postman came around the corner. I gave him good morning. He answered me unsuspiciously. Then I took to my heels and ran. Was, uh, in one of the famous five books by Enid Blyton, he used a similar gambit, uh, trading places with the paper boy and putting on his clothes to escape while the house was being watched. I wonder if she was inspired by the 39 steps. 
a big fan. Time to take a ticket. A porter told me the platform. I saw the train already in motion. Two station officials blocked my way. I dodged them and clambered into the last carriage. I had made it. Oh, that was a short chapter. Oh, that's not another chapter, excuse me. Hmm. Three minutes later, an irate guard interviewed me. He wrote out for me a ticket to Newton Stewart, a name which had suddenly come back to my memory. Then he conducted me from the first class compartment to a third class smoker. The compartment was occupied by a sailor and a stout woman with a child. Ah, uh, third class citizen. <laughs> a third class train compartment. Ah, uh, it's a sail job catching trains. Aye, the impudence of that geared. He needed a scotch tongue to put him in his place. He was complaining of this way and no hain a ticket and her no fever till August twelve month. And he was objecting to this gentleman spitting. <laughs> I love the Scots language. It reminds me, I really must stream uh, Bed Bedlam one of these days. Pope's job, Pius X on the influence of women. More advertisements. Better zoom out a bit more. Let's see. Policeman on trial. Perjury charge at the Old Bailey. Latest wills. Interesting. Signal book theft. Heavy sentence of a blue jacket on a blue jacket. Peerage claim. Captain Forrester had an ancient barony. Oh. Hmm. Affairs in Berlin. New minister chills democratic hopes. Empire Day. Yesterday's parade of 6,000 in Hyde Park. Oh, which I think was... Was that for Queen Victoria's birthday? Which we read about earlier on. I mean, I don't think any of this is, you know, vital. But it's still interesting. Hale Wayman's charter. Extra cost, 23 million a year. Queen Alexandra and the Boy Scouts. Huh. Yeah, that's enough reading the paper. Oh, wait, was there more? No, just the one, it seems. Is that? Yeah, it's the same one. I had a solemn time traveling north that day. You'll notice that Hene was able to do a Scots accent well enough to fool the Scotland Scotswoman. Even though he's never been to Scotland, or anyway, did he say he left it as a child? I 
asked myself why, when I was still a free man, I had stayed on in London, and not got the good of this heavenly country. Then I got out Scudder's little pocket book and studied it. I was certain that Scudder never did anything without a reason, and I was pretty sure there was a cipher in all of this. I had a head for things like chess and puzzles, and I used to reckon myself pretty good at finding out ciphers. These sets of figures looked like they corresponded to letters of the alphabet. But as we know, we couldn't figure it out. Because I forgot to go around them clockwise. <laughs> I woke up at Dunfries just in time to bundle out onto the crowded platform. There was a young man on the platform whose looks I didn't like, but he never glanced at me. I caught sight of myself in the mirror of an automatic machine. With my brown face, my old tweeds and my slouch, I was the very model of one of the hill farmers who are now crowding into the third-class carriages. Since they look for a gentleman in the first class. I, oops. I boarded the Galway train, traveling with half a dozen in an atmosphere of shag and clay pipes. They had come from the weekly market and their mouths were full of prices. I heard accounts of how the lambing had caught, gone up in up the cairn and the duke and a dozen other mysterious water mysterious waters. About above half the men had lunched heavily and were highly flavoured with whiskey, but they took no notice of me. Those are actual photos, I think. It's hard to tell. <laughs> About five o'clock the carriage had emptied and I was left alone as I had hoped. I got out of the next train station. It reminded me of one of those forgotten little stations in the Karu. An old station master with his spade over his shoulder, summoned to the train, sauntered to the train, took charge of a parcel, and went back to his potatoes while a child of ten received my ticket. Only one way to go. <laughs>
I was getting very hungry when I eventually came to a herd's cottage. A brown-faced woman greeted me with the kindly shyness of moorland places. When I asked for a night's lodging, she said I was welcome to the bed in the loft, and very soon she set before me a hearty meal of ham and eggs, scones, and thick sweet milk. At the, dar at the darkening, her man came in from the hills, a lean giant, who had one step covered as much ground as three paces of ordinary mortals. They asked me no questions, for they had the perfect breeding of all the dwellers in the wilds, but I could see they set me down as a kind of dealer. I took some trouble to confirm their view. They refused any payment, and by six the next morning I had breakfasted and was striding southwards again. I don't know what dealer means exactly in this case. All the slackness of the past months was slipping from my bones, and I stepped out like a four-year-old. My notion was to return to the railway line, a, a, station or, a station or two farther on than the place where I had alighted yesterday, and to double back. Just in case they realize I've slipped this way. Oh, right, well, they probably... Or they may have seen me get on the train. I'm not sure how. I waited till I saw the smoke of an east-going train on the horizon. Then I approached the booking office and took a ticket for Dunfries. The booking office? Don't you mean the Bukan office? <laughs> Sanctuary of the Inn. Kind of like the very faint background. You can barely see the face and eyes watching you. <laughs> Sunday, the 24th of May. Galloway, Scotland. I think I said Galway, misread it last chapter. The occupants of the carriage were an old shepherd and his dog, a wall-eyed brute I mistrusted. The man was asleep and on the cushions. Beside him was that morning's Scotsman. I hear the dog, but I don't see it. <laughs> These back memories of the curse of Castle Macduck. Oh, there's the man. And there's the pup. Oh, nice, you can use the mouse wheel. It's very convenient. Good design, uh, developers. You know, one thing I did not think I would be doing today was reading advertisements for underwear from a hundred years ago. And yet here I am. Who knows where our days will take us. zoom in that much. There must be something specific we're supposed to find. Hello, what's that? Wait, what? Does... Oh, show text. I'm not sure what those icons were. 
The Scotsman, May 25th, 1914. the paper and the date. Oh. God. Ah, oh, nice. Hmm. Empire Day murder shocks London. Scotland's Yard's top officers have been called into action following the brutal slaying of a decorated British officer in an affluent apartment block in London near Portland Place. The killing took place during last week's Empire Day celebrations. Oh god, maybe they think that Scudder was us. The as yet unnamed man was discovered in the first floor flat on Saturday morning by its valet, a Mr. Paddock. Intriguingly, the victim was not in charge of the apartment, and the owner was not to be found. Even more intriguing is the arrest of a local milkman found whistling in the hallway of the apartment a mere five minutes away from Oxford Street. Uh. Mr. Paddock sprang the alarm and had the young man arrested. Scotland Yard Commissioner Mr. McGillivray McGill said his top officers were currently investigating the suspect. This is one of the most horrendous murders we have had in, the pa in this part of London for some time. The fact that it happened on Empire Day just makes the whole affair even more abhorrent. We will make, sh we will make sure that no stone is left unturned in bringing the killer to justice. Mr. Paddock had informed the police that the dead man's name was Sir Captain Digby of the 40th Gurkhas and that he had been at the apartment for four days. Right. As yet, Scotland Yard has been unable to confirm the identity. The details of the murder are also sparse. This is the second dead body to have been found in the, this very apartment block in the past week. Just six days earlier, an American businessman, identified as a Mr. Christopher Rick, was found in his apartment having committed suicide. Of course, we know him as Scudder. Neighbor Mrs. Twisden said, This is a respectable part of the city, safe behind closed doors, at least until now. I'm all shook up. I've cancelled my milk order. McGillivray assured residents that, three, that there is nothing to be concerned about, and that there are no apparent connections between the deaths, and that the latest killing is not likely the result of a financial dispute. Missing airman. Fear disaster to Mr. Hamel. Hamel? Mr. Gustav Hamel, the well-known aviator whose intention was to attempt the transatlantic flight, was announced last week. No. Was, a, was expected in London on Saturday morning in order to take part in the aerial derby competition arranged for the afternoon. He was known to have started from the aerodrome at Villa, Villa Coublet at half past four in the morning, but he failed to put in an appearance on the English side of the channel, and as the day wore on without bringing any definite news of him, considerable anxiety on his account gradually made itself felt. Inquiries made in all directions proved fruitless, and yesterday anxiety deepened into serious alarm. Suffragette outrages. King's portrait slashed with an axe. The destruction of exhibition pictures, which had, has been recently a feature of the militant suffragist activity in London, was adopted in Edinburgh for the first time on su Saturday, when a half-length portrait of King George from the brush of Mr. John Lavery, along with a picture of the Queen, of the Royal Scottish Academy was damaged by a woman who slashed it with an axe. 
In view of similar outrages of late, special precautions have been taken at the Academy with the object of frustrating any attempts to destroy the paintings. But when the woman entered the building about noon, no suspicion at first was aroused. Though it was remarked afterwards that she had not, as is usually done by lady visitors, given an umbrella or article of attire in the keeping of the attendant. I wonder if these are real articles from 1914. Portland Place Killer on the Run, Traveling North. New twists and turns in the case of the Portland Place murder as Scotland Yard releases its prime suspect and reveals that the true criminal has escaped the capital. Scotland Yard Commissioner Mr. McGillivray said, We have reason to believe that the killer has left London by one of the northern lines. it wasn't so easy to click off and get returned to the start. We no longer have reason to suspect that the milkman is our murderer or has any connection with the killings of with the killing of Captain Theophilus Digby, found dead earlier this week. Captain Digby is reported to have been on home leave and staying with a friend in an apartment near London's affluent Portland Place apartments. Chief Investigating Officer, Mr. Scaife, told the Times, This was a brutal slaying of a, an honourable man. We urge anyone who may have seen or heard anything on the night of the 23rd of May to come forward and make yourself known. The owner of the apartment in question, a Mr. Richard Hannay, is still missing. I'm not really missing, I'm right here in fact. We were approaching the station at which I had got out yesterday. Mm. 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 Look at those little dots that sometimes appear, like specks. First I thought they were dust motes. The potato digging station master had been gingered up into some activity, for the west-going train was waiting to let us pass. From it descended three men who were asking him questions. Sitting well back in the shadow, I watched them carefully. I supposed that they were the local police who had been stirred up by Scotland Yard and had traced me as far as this one-horse siding. One of them had a book and took down notes. The old potato digger seemed to have turned peevish. The child who had collected my ticket was talking volubly. All the party looked out across the moor, where the white road departed. I hoped they were going to take up my tracks here. I hoped they were going to take up my tracks here. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can make sense. It makes sense how they would have traced him. As we moved away from that station, the old shepherd began to stir. A mistrustful, wall-eyed dog. Oh, quiet, you, you sh Where am I? Oh, where am I? You're on a train, travelling east towards Dumfries, in Scotland. Oh, oh. That's what comes of being a teetotaler. 
I expect my surprise that in him I should have met a blue ribbon stalwart. <laughs> oh, I am a strong teetotaler. I, I took the pledge last month and was now I haven't touched a drop of whiskey since then. Not even a hug my knee. Oh, I was so tempted. Oh, oh, oh that's what I get. I heat better than hellfire and twine looking different ways for the Sabbath. What did it? Yeah. I drink the car, brandy. Now, being a teetotal, I keep it half the whiskey, but I was, oh, I was nip, nip, no day this brandy, and I doubt I'll <laughs> not be wheel for a fun night. But I think we're going to have to discuss the definition of teetotaling around here. My plan had been to get out at some station down the line. But the train suddenly gave me a better chance. I can't remember what when Martinmas is. I don't remember. What we, oh. I looked out and saw that every carriage window was closed was closed, and no human figures appeared in the landscape. ourselves <coughs> scarce excuse me so I dropped quickly from the carriage it would have been all right but for that infernal dog left with a bugle and a brass band. <laughs> Happily, the drunken, oh, the drunken shepherd provided a diversion. He and his dog, which was attached by a rope to his waist, suddenly cascaded out of the carriage. Forgotten me. I looked back, but there was nothing in the landscape. For the first time, I felt the terror of the hunted on me. Hey, the hunted, we played that a couple of weeks ago. It was not the police that I thought of, but the other folk, who knew that I knew Scudder's secret, and dared not let me live. I was certain that they would pursue me with a keenness and vigilance unknown to the British law, and that once their grip closed on me, I should find no mercy. The mood did not leave me until I had reached the rim of, of a... I reached the rim of mountain and flung myself panting over a, on a ridge high above the young waters of the river. I have eyes like a hawk, but I could see nothing moving in the whole countryside. Then I looked into the blue May sky, and there I saw that which set my pulses racing. I was certain. I was as certain as if I had been told that the aeroplane was looking for me, and that it did not belong to the police. These heather hills were no sort of cover if my enemies were in the sky, 
and I must find a different kind of sanctuary. Uh, I'd forgotten about the airplanes. I kept onwards. About six in the evening, I came out of the moorland. through the wilderness with winged step as when a griffin through the wilderness with winged step or hell and moody dale pursues the aramas Aram, aramas 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 <laughs> it's funny you can't see the people at all and then when you click on the hot spot a silhouette actually appears it's almost ghostly See anything change? Maybe it's just letting us know there is indeed a house there. Good evening to you. It's a fine night for the road. Is that place an inn? At your service. I'm the landlord, sir. Ah. And I hope you will stay the night. For, to tell you the truth, I've had no company for a week. Mm -hmm. Very secluded inn indeed. I pulled myself onto the parapet of the bridge and filled my pipe. I began to detect an ally. You're young to be an innkeeper? My father died a year hmm. ago and left me the business. I lived there with my grandmother. It's a slow job for a young man, and it wasn't my choice of profession. Which was? He actually blushed. I want to write books. <laughs> and what better chance could you ask? Man, I've often thought that an innkeeper would make the best storyteller in the world. Oh, not now. M maybe in the old days when you had pilgrims and ballad makers and highwaymen and mail coaches on the road. But not now. Nothing comes here but motor cars full of fat women who stop for lunch and a fisherman or two in the spring and the shooting tenants in August. <laughs> There's not much material to be got out of that. I want to see life, to travel the world and write things like Kipling and Conrad. But the most I've done yet is to get some verses printed in Chambers' journal. That's something. I looked at the inn standing golden in the sunset against the brown hills. I've knocked a bit about the world and I wouldn't despise such a hermitage. Do you think that adventure is only found in the tropics or among gentry in red shirts? Maybe you're rubbing shoulders with it at this moment. That's what Kipling says. Brother romance and all unseen bromance brought up the 915. Um, yes. Bromance? But here's a true tale for you then. And a month from now, you can make a novel out of it. Do it say bromance? Hmm. Interesting. Oh, another silent movie. A story of epic proportions. Mr. Richard Hannay was a successful mining magnate from Kimberley, Australia. Oh, that's where Kimberley is. Hmm. Then his luck changed and he ran into serious financial troubles. We're here for the money. I owe you nothing. <laughs> I 
Okay, this is fun. <laughs> Bugs chased Hane across the Callahan to German Africa, pursuing him across the ocean. thugs at that. <laughs> that hat. He got away and fled to London. Tracked him down. My hat. They had killed his friend and were chasing Hane yet. I would watch that movie. You're looking for adventure? Well, you found it here. The devils are after me and the police are after them. It's a race that I mean to win. By God! It's all pure Ryder Haggard at Conan Doyle! You believe me? Of course I do! I believe everything out of the common. The only thing to distrust is the normal. <laughs> he was very young, but he was the man for my money. The only thing to distrust is the normal. I rather like that, as mottos go. I think they're off my track for the moment, but I must lie close for a couple of days. Can you take me in? He caught my elbow in his eagerness and drew me towards the house. As I entered the inn porch, I heard from the far off the beat of an engine. gave me a room at the back of the house, with a fine outlook over the plateau. I smoked in a chair till daylight, for I could not sleep. The next morning, I wanted some time to myself, so I invented a job for him. He had a motorcycle, a motor bicycle and I sent him off next morning for the daily paper, which usually arrived with the post in the late afternoon. I told him to keep his eyes skinned and make note of any strange figures he saw, keeping a special sharp lookout for motors and aeroplanes. Then I sat down in real earnest to Scudder's notebook. See if we can crack the code. Or we could look around the room. That is also productive. Portland Place murderer in Scotland. London police have reason to believe that the Portland Place murderer has travelled north into Scotland in his bid to escape the authorities. It has also come to light that the milkman has, has provided damning evidence against the flat's owner, Mr. Richard Hannay, in connection to the murder of Captain Theophilus Digby. I told me that he was playing a game, said the milkman. He needed to be a milkman for half an hour, and I believed him. But he never came back. He took my hat and coat too, the thief. The milkman's uniform has since been discovered behind a hoarding in an alleyway opposite Mr. Hannay's apartment. Fear not, if there is a killer in Scotland, we will track him down, 
said the Lothian Inn and Borders Police Chief, Mr. Hamish Smith. We will be putting extra resources into this manhunt. Should anyone spot Mr. Henney, a 37-year-old man of average height and build, they should not try and apprehend him. Henney is known to be a military man with considerable skills with weaponry. Hmm. Yeah, that's the same one. Yes, doesn't look like we're in a very good spot right now. Ah, the Albanian revol revolt. Rebels release prisoners. The insurgents have released all the prisoners. Prince William yesterday rode out to the outposts. Everything is now quiet here. Uh, Carolide... Carloides? Have I been misreading that the whole time? The state of the Balkans has become the most vexing issue on the international stage. Various failures to resolve the Eastern question over preceding de decades have left Europe facing renewed crisis after crisis. Amidst this maelstrom, Greek Prime Minister Konstantin Karolides Oh, okay, they just misspelled it up there. Glad that's them and not me. Is regarded as the key stabilizing force in a region beset by regime changes, rebellion, and intractable territorial claims. Yeah. This there isn't different. Oh, well, no, we did read that, excuse me. Hmm. What have we here? Anything? There's no diamond underneath the scene heading, so maybe there's nothing to interact with. Hmm. Hmm. Just got his book. I don't want to actually trigger us moving forward. So we're good and ready. Let's see what we can devise about this innkeeper. Chambers Journal. Dear Mr. Fraser, thank you for sending us your latest poem, A Frozen Heart in Summer Days. We would be delighted to publish your poem in the January issue of next year. We will return the manuscript once it has been copied by recorded post. Sincerely yours, Edward Lethan, Editor. I don't think that's quite how the publishing industry works these days. Oh, here's the verse. A frozen heart in summer days. Last winter our chests were warm, as homely, as homely fires burnt till dawn. The inn was full with passing trade, a perfect home for travellers bade. The spring was pleasant, and the spring was pleasant, and new life did spring. We cooked up pheasant that my father brought in, but things did change as the sun arrived, but things did change as my father died. The place came empty, my thoughts then lost. The passing of life is the eternal cost. That's, um, that's definitely verse. Now this summer our chests are cold, this inn no longer the place of old. My heart is frozen like the eternal look, 
on my father's face as his life was took. But life goes on, but life goes on. I take over the business as my father's son. My dreams will hold, though never gone. My words have meaning, my father's son. So, certainly dramatic. Uh, I'll say that for it. Is there something else we're supposed to look at here? Yes, ah. Uh, the hills of home. I was born in the land of Scotland, when the, when the heather was turning brown. I grew in the hills of Scotland, then wanted to leave my town. I'm bored in the land of Scotland. Please take me away. These desolate plains of Scotland are not where I wish to stay. What the innkeeper saw. Donald woke to the sound of hammering. Thump, the hammer did strike. Thump, the hammer pierced his brain. Again and again, the beam above his head creaked as the wind whistled round the small cottage. He heard his grandmother moving around in the next room. His father would be at the river out already, checking to see if the eggs had hatched. I think we needn't peruse the innkeeper's papers any further. I guess it's going to make us, like, us the player, actually figure this out. Because I don't know how to break ciphers. Collected January through May 1914. Franklin P. Scudder. Uh. Show text, uh, okay, no show text. Look like all Roman numerals, though, don't they? looking quite so closely at them previously. I glanced out of the window. There seemed to be two of them. Then in aquas... Aquascutums and tweed caps. I don't know what that means. One was slim, the other was sleek. That was the most I could make of my reconnaissance. Ten minutes later... The innkeeper slipped into the room, his eyes bright with excitement. There's two chaps below looking for you. They're in the dining room having whiskies and sodas. They asked about you and said they'd hoped to meet you here. Oh, and they described you jolly well. It's down to your boots and shirt. I told them you'd been here last night and gone off on a motor bicycle this morning. And one of the chaps swore like a navvy. <laughs> I made him tell me what they looked like. It's a good thing we told him that yarn. One was a dark-eyed thin fellow with bushy eyebrows. The other was always smiling 
and lisped in his talk. So Scudder mentioned somebody who lisped. Neither was any kind of foreigner. On this my young friend was positive. I took a bit of paper and wrote words in German as if they were part of a letter. Take this down and say it was found in my bedroom and ask them to return it to me if they overtake me. Okay. Ah, laying a false scent, I do believe. Black stone. Scudder had got on to this, but he could not act for a fortnight. I doubt if I can do any good now, especially as Carolides is uncertain about his plans. But if Mr. T advises, I will do the best I... Mr. T. Your paper woke them up. The dark fellow witnessed white as death and cursed like blazes. And the fat one whistled and looked ugly. They paid for their drinks with half a sovereign and wouldn't wait for change. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Get on your bicycle and go off to Newton Stewart to the chief constable. Describe the two men and say you suspect them of having had something to do with the London murder. You can invent reasons. The two will come back, never fear. Not tonight, for they'll follow me 40 miles along the road, but first thing tomorrow morning, tell the police to be here bright and early. Fun. I'm going to snare them. He set off like a docile child while I worked at Scudder's notes. I had a sudden inspiration. Scudder had said, Julia Zechenyi was the key to with was the key to the Carolides business, and it occurred to me to try it on his cipher. It worked. The five letters of Julia gave me the position of the vowels. Zechenyi gave me the numerals for the principal consonants. I scribbled that scheme on a bit of paper. In half an hour I was reading with a whitish face and fingers that drummed on the table. That evening we dined together. Out of common, out of common decency I had to let him pump me for information. I gave him a lot of stuff about lion hunts and the Matabele war, thinking all the while what tame businesses these were compared to this I was now engaged in. When, I went to, when he went to bed, I again sat up. I had finished Scudder's book. A pack of lies. Hmm. Let's say this is fun stuff. Let's see. I get engaged. I seem to be going at a slower pace than the average player. Probably because I'm reading bunches of the text out loud. We'll do another chapter or two. Tuesday, 26th May, the Inn, Scotland. <clears throat> the next morning I witnessed from my room the arrival of two constables and a sergeant.
They put the, their car in the coach house under the innkeeper's instructions and entered the house. Twenty minutes later, I saw from my window a second car come across the plateau from the opposite direction. He did not come up to the inn, but stopped two hundred yards off in the shelter of a patch of wood. I noticed that its occupants carefully reversed it before leaving it. My plan had been to lie hidden, to lie hid in my bedroom and see what happened. I had a notion that if I could bring the police and my other more dangerous pursuers together, something might work out of it to my advantage. But now I had a better idea. Hmm? Right. Thank you. For the innkeeper, perhaps? Oh. More. I call them action sequences for lack of a better word. Aren't you glad? Guys, glad that these aren't timed. Or it's not like DDR or something. Mouse, mouse revolution. I stole gently out onto the plateau. Touring car. The wind seemed to bring me the sound of angry voices. You may picture me driving that 40 HP car for all she was worth over the crisp moor roads on that shining May morning, glancing back at first over my shoulder and looking anxiously to the next turning, then driving with a vague eye just wide enough awake to keep on the highway, for I was thinking desperately of what I had found in Scudder's pocketbook. Scudder's notebook deciphered. This war was going to come as a mighty surprise to Britain. Carolides' death would set the Balkans by the ears, and then Vienna would chip in with an ultimatum. Russia wouldn't like that, and there would be high words, but Berlin would play the peacemaker and pour oil on the waters, till suddenly she would find a good cause for a quarrel, pick it up, and in five hours let fly at us. That was the idea, and a pretty good one, too. <laughs> it was no question of preventing a war. That was coming, as sure as Christmas. Had been arranged, said Scudder, ever since February 1912. Carolides wow. was going to be the occasion. The bare bones of the tale were all that was in the book. These, and one queer phrase which occurred half a dozen times inside brackets. Thirty-nine steps. Ah. The phrase. And at its last time of use it ran. Thirty-nine steps. I counted them. High tide, 10.17 p.m. I could make nothing of that. The bare bones of the tale were all that was in the book. Oh, oops. These that was and one queer phrase which occurred half a dozen times inside. Can't skip or go back. Thirty-nine. Hey, let's press the right mouse button and see what that does. And at its no. last time of use, it ran. Thirty-nine steps. I counted them. High tide, ten seventeen p.m. I could make nothing of that. In spite of all the nonsense talked in Parliament, 
there was a real working alliance between France and Britain, and the two general staffs met every now and then and made plans for joint action in case of war. Well, in June, a very great swell was coming over from Paris, and he was going to get nothing less than a statement of the disposition of the British home fleet on mobilization. It was something uncommonly important. Yeah. It's next month. The 15th day of June was going to be a day of destiny, a bigger destiny than the killing of a Dago. It was so big that I um. didn't blame Scudder for keeping me out of the game and wanting to play a lone hand. That, I was pretty clear, was his intention. Hmm. I know that's a slur word. I believe it's considered that now. I wonder if it was in the 19 teens. I would the assume whole story so. was in the notes, with gaps, you understand, which he would have filled up from his memory. He stuck down his authorities too and had an odd trick of giving them all a numerical value and then striking a balance which stood for the reliability of each stage in the yarn. Hmm. Nothing but the truth. On the bare moor, I was at the aeroplane's mercy. My only chance was to get to the leafy cover of the valley. There came a thick wood where I slackened my speed. I heard the hooting of another car, and I realized, upon my horror, that I was almost upon a couple of gateposts through which a private road debouched on the highway. I clapped on my brakes, but my impetus was too great. I did the only one thing possible, and ran slap into the end, the hedge on the right. branch of hawthorn had got me in the chest, lifted me up, and held me, while a ton or two of expensive meat, metal slipped below. Oh. Slowly that thorn let me go. As I scrambled to my feet, a hand took me by the arm. I found myself looking at a tall young man, and I scrambled to my feet. I say, oh, bless me, I'm dreadfully sorry. Are you hurt? R really, I, I must apologize. Oh, bless my soul. Do tell me you're all right. My blame, sir. It's lucky that I did not add homicide to my follies. Well, that's the end of my Scotch motor tour. <laughs> Might have been the end of my life. A pragmatic view of it. He plucked out a watch and studied it. You're the right sort of fellow. I can spare a quarter of an hour, and my house is two minutes off. I'll see you clothed and fed and snug in bed. Where's your kit, by the way? Is it in the burn along with the car? It's in my pocket. A toothbrush? I'm a colonial. I travel light. A colonial? <laughs> by God, you're the very man I've been praying for. Are you by any blessed chance a free trader? A free trader? I am. Oh, good I am show. now. <laughs> He patted my shoulder and hurried me to, into his car. We do have a fair number of lucky encounters. We just have to know how to exploit them. Presently we drew up before a comfortable looking shooting box and he ushered me indoors. Hmm. 
First, he flung half a dozen of his suits before me, for my own had been pretty well reduced to rags. I selected a loose blue serge, which differed mo most conspicuously from my former garments, and borrowed a linen collar. Then he hailed me to the dining room. Thank you. Hmm. You find me in a deuce of a mess, Mr... Oh, by the by, you haven't told me your name. Uh, Twiston. Twiston? Any like relation to old Tommy Twiston of the 60th? No? Oh, well. Well, you see, I'm the liberal candidate for this part of the world, and I had a meeting on tonight at Brattleburn, and that's my chief time in an infernal Tory stronghold. I'd got the colonial ex-premier fellow, Crumpleton, coming to speak for me tonight. Mm -hmm and had the thing tremendously built, and the whole place ground-baited. This afternoon, I had a wire from the ruffian saying he'd got influenza at Blackpool. Here I am, left to do the whole thing myself. I had meant to speak for ten minutes, and now I must go on for forty. And though I've been racking my brains for three hours to think of something, I simply cannot last the course. Now you've got to be a good chap and help me. You're a free trader and can tell our people what a, a washout protection is in the colonies. All you fellows have the gift of the gab. I wish to heaven I had it. I'll be forever more in your debt. Mm. I had very few notions about free trade, but I saw no other chance of getting what I wanted. All right. Um, I'm not much good as a speaker, but I'll tell them a bit about Australia. Oh. At my words, the care of the age, the cares of the ages, slipped from his shoulders. <laughs> he lent me a big driving coat, and never troubled to ask why I had started on a motor tour without possessing an Ulster. I mean, the Ulster is the type of coat. Glossary wouldn't go amiss here sometimes, for us American idiots. As we slipped down the dusty roads, the young man poured into my ears the simple facts of his history. Sir Harry. Sir Harry was orphaned at an early age and was brought up by his uncle, who is a member of the British cabinet. He had gone round the world after leaving Cambridge, and then, being short of a job, his uncle has advised, had advised politics. But he had no preference in parties. He was liberal because his family had always been Whigs. His uncle pulled a few strings and posted Harry in Tweedale as the liberal candidate, without any hope of him winning over its conservative constituents. Wait, we just... He knew about horses, and jawed away about the derby entries, and he was full of plans for improving his shooting. Sounds like a wonderful politician. Just the sort I'd vote for. If he were the only candidate. Possibly. Altogether, a very clean decent, callow young man. Oh. That's the new chapter. Maybe this will be the last one for the night, which will put us just about the halfway point. The action's certainly picking up a bit. I remember this there was a scene from the book, or at least part of it, and he discusses Sir Harry speaking. He says, It was the most appalling rot, too. <laughs> Which could be applied to many a politician's speeches, I do believe. The Radical Candidate. Tuesday, 26th May, 1914. Masonic Hall, Brattleburn.
game is quite user friendly. The hall had about 500 in it, uh, women mostly, a lot of bald heads and a dozen or two young men. The chairman was a Weasley minister with a reddish nose. He lamented on Crumpleton's absence, soliloquized on his influenza, and gave me a certificate as a trusted leader of Australian thought. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Interesting that they say <laughs> soliloquized when he's speaking to them. Oh well. <laughs> there were two policemen at the door, and I hoped they took note of that testimonial. Then Sir Harry started. <laughs> this should be fun. He had a bushel of notes from which he read, and when he let go of them he fell into one prolonged stutter. Every now and then he remembered a phrase he had learned by heart, straightened his back, and gave it off like Henry Irving. The next moment he was bent double and crooning over his papers. He talked about the German menace and said it was all a Tory invention to cheat the poor of their rights and keep back the great flood of social reform, but that organized labor realized this and laughed the Tories to scorn. He was all for reducing our navy as a proof of our good faith and then sending Germany an ultimatum, telling her to do the same, or we would knock her in a co into a cocked hat. Oh. Is that? I wonder if that's like an actual expression regarding defeating ships. Or, or more general, I just know that they referred to it, uh, defeating the Nagatuck as knocked into an ugly cocked hat and Richmond is a hard road to travel. I have entirely too much nonsense in my brain. The most appalling rot, too. <laughs> but hey, we were reading Stonewall Jackson earlier, so you can see why it might be on the brain. He said that, but for the Tories, German, Germany and England will be fellow workers in peace and reform. I thought of the little black book in my pocket. A giddy lot Scudder's friends cared for peace and reform. In a queer way, I liked the speech. You could see the niceness of the chap shining out behind the muck with which he had been spoon-fed. <laughs> I mightn't be much of an orator, but I was a thousand percent better than Sir Harry. I simply told them all I could remember about Australia, all about its Labour Party and emigration and universal service, praying there should be no Australian there. I doubt if I remembered to mention free trade, but I said there were no Tories in Australia, only Labour and Liberals. And I started in to tell them the kind of glorious business I thought could be made out of the Empire if we really put our backs into it. Altogether, I fancy I was rather a success. The Minister didn't like me, though. <laughs> I'd like to propose a vote of thanks to Sir Harry for his statesmanlike speech, and to Mr. Twisden whose words had the eloquence of an emigration agent. <laughs> I can't win them all. A ripping speech, Tristan. Now, you're coming home with me. I'm all alone, and if you'll stop a day or two, I'll show you some very decent fishing. The important part of politics, fishing. Back at Sir Harry's, we had a hot supper and then drank grog. 
The time had come for me to put my cards on the table. I saw by this man's eye that he was the kind you can trust. Listen, Sir Harry. I have something pretty important to say to you. You're a good fellow, and I'm going to be frank. Where on earth did you get that poisonous rubbish you talked tonight? Oh, was it as bad as that? <laughs> it did sound rather thin. I got most of it out of the Progressive magazine. Poisonous and rubbish. And that agent chap of mine keeps sending me. You surely don't think Germany would ever go to war with us? Oh, heavens Ask no. that question in six weeks, and it won't need an answer. If you'll give me your attention for half an hour, I'm going to tell you a story. I blinked no detail. So you see, you have got here in your house the man that is wanted for the Portland Place murder. Oh, we actually told him everything. Your duty is to send your car for the police and give me up. I don't think I'll get very far. There'll be an accident, and I'll have a knife in my ribs an hour or so after arrest. Mm. Nevertheless, it's your duty as a law-abiding citizen. Perhaps in a month's time you'll be sorry, but you have no cause to think of that. Hmm. He was looking at me with bright, steady eyes. Hmm. What was your job in Rhodesia, Mr. Hannay? Mining engineer. I've made my pile cleanly, and I've had a good time in the making of it. Not a profession that weakens the nerves, is it? <laughs> As to that, my nerves are good enough. Who? What's this? Some sort of blade. I took the hunting knife and did the old Mash Mashona trick of tossing it in the air and catching it in my lips. Oh my, that sounds very dangerous. Hey, RTM Havoc. I don't want food. Hey, thanks for dropping by. I may be an ass on the platform, but I can size up a man. How are you doing tonight? You're no murderer, and you're no fool. I believe you're speaking the truth. I'm going to back you up. Now, what can I do? Jolly good of you, Sir Harry. I want you to write a letter to your uncle. I've got to get in touch with the government people sometime before the 15th of June. He pulled his mustache. And while he's doing that, everybody, please go follow Artyom Havoc, who is a variety streamer with a penchant for Star Wars. I'm quite partial to Star Wars myself, you know. Oh no, you have a lot of back pain. Sorry to hear that. I hope, yeah, I hope it does get better tomorrow. That's, I know that's quite unpleasant. But yeah, my pleasure, Havoc. One of, one of those things that usually a good night's sleep will help with it a lot. Yeah, we're playing the 39 steps and having quite a good time of it so far. That won't help you. Speaking for myself. This is foreign office business, and my uncle would have nothing to do with it. Besides, you'd never convince him. No. I'll go one better. I'll write to the permanent secretary at the foreign office. He's my godfather and one of the best going. Now, what do you want? This aristocracy and politics are quite well connected. He sat down at a table and wrote to my dictation. Hmm. Dear Walter, I hope this letter finds you well, and I must apologize for not being in touch for such a long while. 
I'm finding all my time taken up with this political business, even to the detriment of my fishing. Anyway, on to more important matters. Without sounding overly enigmatic, I'm writing to say that if a man called Twiston happens to make your acquaintance before the 15th of June this year, it would be to your benefit to treat him kindly, despite what he may look like. This Twisden chap will, pursue, will prove his bona fides by passing the words Black Stone and whistling Annie Laurie. Listen carefully to him, dear uncle. He has something to say that might just wake you up. Cheerio and happy hunting, Harry. I didn't remember him using a tune in the book. I believe. Uh, I can't. Did Hitchcock do that in the film adaptation? I don't know. It might. Because I know he did something like that in The Lady Vanishes, but. I mean, I probably should rewatch the movie and reread the book. <laughs> Good. That's the proper style. Oh, by the way, you find my godfather, his name's Sir Walter Bullivant, down at his country cottage for Whitsuntide. It's close to Artenswell on the Kennet. And that's done. Now, what's the next thing? You're about my height. Lend me the oldest tweed suit you've got. Anything will do, so long as the colour is the opposite of the clothes I destroyed this afternoon. Then, show me a map of the neighbourhood and explain to me the lie of the land. Lastly, if the police come seeking me, just show them the car in the glen. If the other lot turn up, tell them I caught the South Express after your meeting. Any more false sense yet? They always seem to find me out. He did or promised to all these to do all these things. I shaved off the remnants of my mustache and got inside an ancient suit of what I believe is called heather mixture. The map gave me some notion of my whereabouts and told me two things I wanted to know: where the main railway to the south could be joined, and what were the wildest districts near at hand. He wakened me from my slumbers in the smoking room armchair and led me blinking into the dark starry night. An old bicycle was found in a tool shed and handed over to me. First, turn to the right up by the long firwood. By daybreak, you'll be well into the hills. Then, I should pitch the machine into a bog and take to the moors on foot. You can put in a week among the shepherds and be as safe as if you were in New Guinea. Thank you. Think nothing of it. You got me out of a tight spot last night. Now, you better get cracking. Good luck. <laughs> All you were going to talk was poisoned rubbish. <laughs> I pedaled diligently up steep roads of hill gravel till the skies grew pale with morning. Hmm. And that's the end of the chapter. And... Yes, I think that's rather a good stopping place. We are just about halfway. And it automatically saves, which is lovely. Let me... Switch over here, and let me... Disable that sound, and we'll wrap up. been enjoying the 39 steps quite a bit. Uh, what some of the reviews were saying are definitely valid criticisms. 
it's linear. The gameplay elements are somewhat minimalistic, which has been an issue with some of these multimedia adaptations since, I don't know, the early CD-ROM days. And sometimes the pace is slow, but I think I think it works. It you know, kind of gets you in the right mood for the story and still keeps it moving along with enough action. But it does that make me think, and this is always the danger with some of these things. Like it was the same way when I started reading Pride and Prejudice and Sea Monsters, and like you kind of think, oh. This reminds me how good the original work is. Maybe I should just go back and read the original book. <laughs> and, you know, I should get around to reading all the sequels. But I think I think it's a fun adventure game slash visual novel. And, and yeah, we'll continue it next Sunday and finish it. It should be quite doable. And I'll probably start a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's hard to get Hannay's voice exactly right, matching the voice actor. Some are easier than others. Certainly had a much easier time with scratches. The voice acting is good. I'm glad they, you know, went to the trouble of hiring professionals and you know, even if the game's style and choices aren't for everybody, it's uh, really has good production values and a lot of effort went into it. Mm. How to uh, let you guys know, on Wednesday evening I'll be streaming. I'll finish Soldier of Fortune, which, depending on how well I can find the final boss, I can't think we have that much of left. And then probably starting a new game the new longer game and then next weekend we'll yeah, we'll do something for short horror Saturday and then finish the 39 steps yeah um, I appreciate everybody coming by and hopefully you, you're enjoy, enjoying this and we'll get to see a lot more venturing through the Scots countryside next time. And some of the more iconic moments from the book. As we run into the man with the lisp, but we still haven't seen the man who can hood his eyes like a hawk. And I still don't know exactly what that means, and considering that all the characters are rendered as white silhouettes, I don't think the game is going to shed much light on that. If everybody could hang around while we raid somebody, I'd very much appreciate that. The game really is easy to play. It's got large text and it's so accessible. And can run in extremely high resolutions, too. <laughs> A sort that might crash my computer. You guys, it, and I, like I said earlier, it is on Steam if you guys want to check it out for yourselves so you don't have to go to the trouble of buying an imported DVD-ROM. Life's so much easier these days. Old School J is live and we raided last night and Al Fornado's streaming. I, I don't believe we've raided him. And what's he? Ooh, he's streaming Ancient Domains of Mystery. I think, I think that's what ADOM stands for. <laughs> yeah, Fornado's a good guy. Let's go say hi to him. And it looks like I have fixed that bug with the... which was causing the crashes at long last, but... Knock on wood. I 
I must have. <laughs> Ah, good. It is ready. <laughs> oh, I want to thank everybody who came by and said hello and lurked. I'm for a blind gamer. I do a variety of games, especially horror and retro. And apparently 100-year-old hundred Scots thrillers. And yeah, I'll be streaming again Wednesday. Thank you for coming by and... I hope that everybody enjoys the rest of your weekend, and please do say hi to Fornado. And raid. Oh, thank you, Havoc. And I hope that I'll catch your next stream again soon, too. Have a good night. Huh.